Good morning, everybody. Hey, all right, good job. Hey, uh, if you are worried about the next generation uh, of believers and of the world, I would suggest to you to hold on a second. God still works. God still works in the next generation, no matter how you take their lives and how you see culture going, God is still at work. He has been for 2,000 plus years. And so every time that he works, he always raises up new leaders and new preachers, like today, and new people to, to take the message forward, take the mission forward. And we want to be a part of that as a church, and I want to be a part of that as a leader to raise up young leaders and give them opportunities and give them at-bats. And so today we're having Brandon Palatz come and speak with us. Uh, he just got engaged to Emma last Saturday, if I'm right, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, and turned 20 last week, like teenager, just turned 20, love it. He's also from Nebraska, so <laughs> there's nothing, no, no, come on. I did not do that just because of that. That helped, that helped, but it, not just because of that. So welcome Brandon up. Come on up, Brandon. Give him a round of applause. Yeah. Uh, Brandon has felt the call in his life to be a pastor. Uh, I know how that feels, and uh, it's a good thing. He's a pastoral ministry major down at Crown in his second year, and so it's all for you, bud. It's all you. Thanks, Nick. You're good. And thank you, uh, church, for allowing me to have this opportunity to speak to you. Um, it's not something that I take lightly, and it's something that the Lord has burdened my heart with, um, the seriousness of sharing His truths. Um, so i just like to open up in prayer. Um, and just ask that the Lord would be uh, in, in this time of, of service. So, Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity that you've given to me. Um, and Lord, I just ask that you would be speaking, that your spirit would come uh, and fill this place, and that it wouldn't be about me, it wouldn't be about anyone else in this room, Lord, that it would all be for you and for your glory. Um, so in this I pray, amen. So we're going to open up to Ecclesiastes. Um, I know there's a lot of negative connotations around this book. Kind of a depressing book, right? Um, and Solomon wrote it in a time of depression, I think. So uh, I'm just going to read through the first uh, 11 verses of this book just to kind of give us some context of what it's about and what, it, uh, what it's saying. So vanity of vanities, says the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after him. Pretty depressing, right? Like, we've seen everything. Nothing matters. That's why I titled this sermon, What's the Point? What is the point? I mean, I th I'm sure a lot of us have asked that question. I've asked myself that question. Working at a summer camp this past summer, I asked, why am I here? Yes, I was there to minister to the Lord, but there were moments from just wondering, why am I here? What's the point? Or being at school, why am I here? What's the point? I could be doing other things, right? So what's the purpose? Um, so I want to kind of look at why did Solomon write this book? What's the point of him writing this book? So if you look at, um, I'm just going to reference back to 1 Kings 3. There Solomon asks for wisdom. The Lord gives him an opportunity. He says, Solomon, what do you want? Solomon says, I want your wisdom, Lord. 
And God just bestowed upon him supernatural wisdom. Wisdom that no man has ever seen nor will ever see again. That was a, a very um, good choice on Solomon's part, right? And then in 1 Kings 11, only seven chapters, uh, sorry, eight chapters later, we see that Solomon rejects the Lord. It talks about all the women that he brought upon himself with them, their gods. And I think that's the point where Solomon's like, what is the point of life? Because he turns away from the Lord. In verse 4 it says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. He had everything. He had wisdom, supernatural wisdom from the Lord. He had wealth. He had authority. His kingdom was vast in Israel. And he, especially the most important one, he had God's blessing. But he turned away from it. He rejected that. Why? Why did he still turn away? And I believe it's right here that he starts to question, what is the point of life? And he sought after everything to find that answer. Um, as you can see throughout the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes, he seeks after work. He seeks after even wickedness, trying to find purpose in that. He seeks after wealth. He seeks after wisdom. Yet nothing satisfied him. Nothing satisfied him. If you look at today, I mean, you could look at all the things that we chase after, that non-Christians chase after to try and satisfy themselves. They chase after wealth and work as well. They chase after drugs. They chase after everything that you could possibly think of to find a satisfaction. And even the things that are seemingly non-sinful, like work, they didn't satisfy Solomon. And they don't satisfy us. That is the definition of a non-Christian life. Meaningless. Because everything they seek to find in life has no purpose. They're lost. And I think at the same time, we as Christians can do the same thing. We can seek to find satisfaction in things other than God. Seek to find satisfaction in things that don't necessarily matter. And um, sometimes we settle. Sometimes we don't try to find meaning in our work. Sometimes we don't try to find meaning in doing the day-to-day -day menial task is, task, tasks that are set before us. Um, A.W. A. Tozer wrote a book called... Um, God's pursuit of man. And it, in it, one of the chapters, he talks about how Christians tend to separate the spiritual, um, what we would call spiritual, coming to church, worshiping God, reading our Bible, praying, all these things that we bring on those connotations of being spiritual. And we separate those things, uh, I have to define this term for you, secular, we think of secular as sinful, but the way that A.W. Tozer was using it, secular are those things that we, that we do on our day-to-day -day basis that I was talking about, like mowing the lawn or washing the dishes or doing our clothes. Um, we say those things over here, the secular things, those aren't part of my Christian walk. Those don't matter. I just got to get through them. I just got to do them. It's just part of every day. But over here... The spiritual, this is what's important, right? I have to go to church, I have to pray, I have to read my Bible, I have to do all these things. But we separate the two as if they can't connect. And I'm going to define that for you a little later. My question is, can we connect the secular and the spiritual? Another question is, can we take something that is spiritual 
and make it secular? I think that's a really serious question that we have to ask. Because, um, and here's an example of scripture of that. Um, I'm just going to turn to Matthew 23, uh, verses 1 through 7. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm just going to read through, through those for you. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fingers long, and they love the place of honor at, at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others." The Pharisees made their relationship with God, their authoritative positions, about themselves. They took something that should have been holy, that should have been spiritual, and made it secular. They made it about them. Do we do the same today? Do we come to church? Do we pray and read our Bible and make it about us? Do we try to satisfy our own desires? Do we nitpick at the little things that are in church because it offends us? Why do we do that? Because that is pointless. And I would argue that that is sinful. And the, the definition that I a tribute to pointlessness and meaninglessness is sin. That is the exact definition of it. When we sin, we are putting ourselves in a position that is utterly and just meaningless because it's completely against God. It's completely against who He is. It brings shame to God on God especially if we're claiming to be Christians. So, for the Pharisees, it became about them. It wasn't about God. We need to be careful not to do that ourselves. Um, so, now I'm going to move a little bit farther into Ecclesiastes and kind of try and figure out, okay, if there's all this stuff, like, What is the point? All these things are just meaningless. Then why are we here? What's the point of life? It's a question that a lot of us ask. And the same book um, gives an answer to that question in verse 9 of chapter 3 in Ecclesiastes. It says, What gain has a worker from his toil? doesn't look very promising at this point. Solomon's asking a question again. What's the point of working? Um, But the next verse uh, provides hope for that. I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Solomon Solomon brings God into the picture. God. God is what matters. God gives purpose. And Solomon has, only three chapters in, has finally um, kind of figured that out and saying... Wait, God is the one in control. God is in charge. Verse 12, or verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in a man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has, been, has done from the beginning to the end. God is the one making things beautiful, not us. God is the reason we do anything. God gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And to do anything outside of that is pointless. Because God is purpose. 
For the definition of purpose, I said Christ. Christ is the definition of purpose. If you look at His life from His conception in Mary's womb to His death to His resurrection and ascension, He was glorifying God. He was bringing praise to His name and pointing at Him all the time as His Father. And in that was purpose, was meaning. And as we are called to be imitators of Christ, so we should also imitate that. We should also seek to bring glory and honor to God in everything that we do, in everything that we say, in everything that we think. No matter what. I, I just want to highlight a portion of that scripture. Um, he, he has put eternity into man's heart. I think for Christians, we often get short-sighted. For myself especially, we tend to focus on the here and now. What's right in front of me? This is what matters right now. Instead of putting our minds on what is ahead, on the eternal, God has put that in our hearts for a reason. We should be eternally minded. If you look at Christ and His temptation in Matthew chapter 4, if he had just been focused on his, what was in front of him, he was hungry. He was thirsty. He was wanting his children to come to him. All those things were tempted. He was tempted with bread. He was tempted with the chance to have the kingdoms. Satan said, here, if you bow down to me, I will give you these kingdoms. And if he had been short-sighted and focusing on that moment, that is what he wanted. He wanted the people to come to him. He wanted authority over them. But he looked ahead. He looked to eternity. He saw what his sacrifice in time, those kingdoms are his. Those kingdoms would be him, his. He wasn't short-sighted. He didn't focus on the here and now, and we shouldn't either. We should focus on what is ahead. What is eternal? And that has an effect on how we perceive things. It teaches us not to be selfish. It teaches us not to say, well, I want this right now, but to be patient and wait. God will satisfy us in time. So if you look at verses 12 and 13, I perceive that there is nothing better for them to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. <coughs> Excuse me. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Seems kind of contradictory. Because now he's saying, Take pleasure in your drink and toil. Before he was saying, what's the point? What's the difference? God's the difference. God is the one in that. There's nothing better to be joyful and do good as long as they live. Um, I think Paul references, <coughs> excuse me, references to that um, in First, First Corinthians chapter ten, uh, thirty-one through thirty-three. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to, to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Paul, in that, was talking about food offered to idols um, in, that, in the previous chapter. And he was referencing to the fact that eating the food from idols, as long as it's not a stumbling block for your brothers, can still be glorifying to me. The food that you eat <coughs> can still be glorifying to me. Um, so, 
At this point, I, I want to go back and reference to A.W. Tozer and what he talked about, about bringing together the spiritual and the secular. Remember, secular being the mundane things that we do in life. <laughs> Is that possible? Um, A.W. Tozer said yes, and I believe God says the same thing. Because in 1 Corinthians, it talks about eating or drinking. The most simple things that we could ever do in life is eat and drink. Yet, God says, give glory to me in that. We are capable of doing that. We're capable of giving God glory, even in eating and drinking. I think a lot of it has to do with our attitude about things. If we're coming before the dinner table and being like, oh man, I hate this meal. This is like my least favorite meal. I'm, Mom, why did you have to make this for me? That's a terrible attitude. How is that pleasing to the Lord? It's funny, right? Like, it's a terrible attitude to have. How is that glorifying to God? It's not. <laughs> That's not glorifying to God. But we've come before the Lord with a grateful attitude. We say, God, I know I don't like this meal as much, but thank you for it. Thank you that I even have food. Thank you that I get to come around the dinner table with people that I enjoy being with. Maybe I don't enjoy being with them, but still, thank you. Um, it's just, even like mowing the lawn, it's a daily task. It's something that we don't necessarily have to do, but it makes it look nice, right? So, in everything that we do, as long as, <coughs> again, as long as it's not sinful, as long as it's not against God, I believe we are capable, and I believe Scripture says we are capable of bringing honor and glory to Him in it. In our work, in our pleasures that we do in our daily lives, God wants us to do that. And to do it uh, with a joyful heart. To do it with an attitude of praise towards Him. That's something that God has just been highlighting for me throughout this whole summer. Working with people, working with kids, glorifying Him, even though I was tired, even though I was frustrated with some of the things happening at camp, even though I was frustrated with people, to just take a step back and say, God, thank you for these situations. Because they cause growth in me. They cause me to understand you more. They cause me to love you more and rely on you more. We should take these trials with thanksgiving. So let us glorify God in all that we do. Let us do it with a joyful heart. <coughs> Excuse me. So look at uh, the last verse that I want to highlight for you. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before Him. So what is the point? What matters? What's important? in your life, in my life? What do we chase after more than God? Because Solomon chased after everything and found nothing. He found worthlessness. Let's learn from his example. Don't chase after things that don't matter. Don't chase after trying to do things without involving God in them. Serve the Lord with a joyful heart. That is the meaning of life. That is the purpose of life. When God is in the center of it, guiding everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think. 
when he is embodying, when we are embodying him and who he is, that is purpose. That is what God wants us to do. So let us glorify and serve the Lord in all that we do, as that is the purpose of our lives. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm going to pray us out. I'm going to pray a blessing over Brandon and uh, just a blessing on his life and his ministry that he has and that's coming up for him and hopefully decades to come. It'll be good. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Brandon. Father, we thank you for the calling you have put on his life. And Father, we thank you for the message that he had for us today, that there's hope in you, there's purpose in you, and what's the point? It's living for you, working for you, taking pleasure in the things that you've given us. And Father, we thank you so much that he has accepted this call, that he is, he is following after you, Father. And Father, would you fill him with the Spirit to continue? Would you fill him with the strength to continue, even with setbacks that might come, Father, with, with difficulties that might come, Father, that he would keep his eye on you, that he would keep his feet following after you, and Father, that Jesus would be that person. Jesus would be straight ahead of him, and he would never waver. So, Father, we thank you for Brandon. We pray a blessing on his life and his ministry. And, uh, Father, we pray that this week this message would, would stick in our hearts, that we would continue to hear this word from, from you. And, Father, we thank you for that. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.